Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Jarrell Mason. Welcome to another edition of Beyond the Album Cover, where we get inside the entertainment industry with those in the know and give them their flowers while they're here to be celebrated. With me right now, I have a man who, to me, is one of the most underrated male R&B singers that's came out in the past 40, 50 years and was the secret sauce to the sound of Hush. Yes, that Hush with himself, Mr. Lilo Thomas, who will be interviewing tonight, Freddie Jackson, Melba Moore, Kashif, and the list goes on and on. We can't forget about Paul Lawrence. He has a new single that'll be dropping out at the end of the month. You know his hit singles such as I'm In Love, You A Good Girl, I Don't Like Those Nasty Girls Either, Lilo, and also I'm In Love off the 1987 album Lilo and I Wanna Make Love All Night Long, which some of you probably were probably conceived on the quiet storm while that was playing. So ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause and a big welcome to Beyond the Album Cover, Mr. Lilo Thomas. Mr. Thomas, thank you for coming on, sir. Oh, thank you for having me. Man, I appreciate you taking the time. I'm doing great now that I've had a chance to interview you. This has been in the works for months, and I'm glad that you agreed to come on the podcast. Yeah, definitely. But it's, right. it's great to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do this. Yes, sir. So let's go ahead and not waste any further time. So was music something you always wanted to do, or were you focused on doing art? since you went to the school, Parsons School of Design and Track, because I believe you qualified for the 84 Olympics, correct? Correct. Yeah. Music was always, you know, my main goal. I used to always say as a kid, I'm going to do music and make a living from it, or I'm just going to be a bum. The, the reason why I, I went to school, I mean, you know, people would tell you, well, what, what's your backup plan? And I really didn't pay any attention to it because my plan was like, I'm doing music and, and that's it. It's either that or nothing. But it wasn't until my, you know, my mom, you know, sat me down and asked me, you know, well, let's just say it doesn't work for you. What else would you, would you want to do? And uh, I, I love to draw. I always love to draw. So I said, okay, if my mom is saying this to me, maybe I need to pay attention to it. So I, I, um, I took a test and got a scholarship to go to Parsons School of Design. And, and that's the only reason why I, I did it because my mom said, well, you know, you need to maybe have a, a fallback on playing. Mm -hmm. So with the School of Design, what was the admission process like? Did you have to submit any sketch drawings or anything before getting the letter saying whether you got in or denied admission? Yes, they had uh, different levels that you had to you know, uh, apply uh, your skills of, of art and just your understanding of art. And, you know, the academics was a part of it as well, but it was basically based off of, you know, how could you, how do you draw? How do you, you think about drawing? And they would give you these little projects to do and, and wanted to know how you interpreted what, what they said. All right. Now, was singing something that you did while doodling in your sketchbook? What came first, your love of music or your love for art? Definitely, it was, um, they both sort of went together. I, used, I started singing in my father's church. He was a minister, and he used to take my sister and I around because he would preach in other churches, and people would come to his church and preach, and we would open, we were sort of the opening act, I guess you could say. That was where, um, you know, I, I learned that you could make money, you know, from doing that. And I, I love to sing. So uh, there was one time we did a, uh, one of the churches, it was a Spanish church. And um, we had to learn this song in Spanish in the back. And we took it in, we learned it, we went out. And the, the, the minister of that church liked us so much, he gave us one of those little uh, yellow packets. And it had, you know, a couple of bucks in it. And I was like, hey, this, this felt pretty good. You know, I could, I could do this for a living. And that's where that sort of came in. So uh, that's how that worked. Right. Now, what was the first record that you remember purchasing at the record store and saying, man, I want to be a singer just like Artist X, Artist Y, or Artist Z? Well, the first record I purchased was uh, Sly and the Family Stone. I just was, I was just blown away by the the, the style of um, Sly and the Family Stones, and, and and Sly was just too cool, you know. I I enjoyed 
watching how he's phrased. And um, I was also a big fan of uh, Curtis Mayfield, which is my mother plays a lot of Curtis Mayfield. So, but but my first record was, I, you know, definitely Sly and the Family Stone. Right. You know, can't, so I, can't, can't go wrong I, with I, Sly. And also, I know. from Brooklyn, New York. Now, can you tell me about, you were probably had on your dial WBLS, or what was the popular AM station at the time. And can you talk about the impact of BLS and the late great Frankie Crocker and what he meant to just urban music in general? Frankie was the man. I mean, you know, his, his whole slogan was like, you know, the only time you want to turn on your radio is when Frankie's on. And that's basically how it went. You know, you didn't even listen to the radio until it was time for Frankie Crocker to come on. And um, he he played, you know, stuff like the Shy Lights and just, he, he was just into what urban music was all about. And I, I definitely enjoyed, you know, turning on it and just checking him out. I was amazed how, you know, these, these groups and just getting to, to, to experience, you know, R&B music. Because coming out of the church, my dad didn't, didn't really let us listen, you know, to, to R&B music. And, you know, if we got games, we couldn't, he would take the dice out of the games and stuff. So he was very strict about, you know, stepping outside of, you know, the church. So it was, it was good to get a chance to sneak and check out Frankie Crocker. And, and we also had a station here, Kiss. And it, uh, that was a, another one of our R&B stations that was, you know, very instrumental in, you know, bringing classic R&B music. Yep, 98.7 yep, KISS FM, homes of legends like Chuck Leonard, Yvonne Mobley, Chuck Chillout, yeah. Tony Humphreys, yeah. Latin Rascals, and yeah. Master wow. Mix by wow. Shep Pettibone. <laughs> that, was, that was great. It was good times. Yeah, because those master mixes were appointment recording, and also BLS with Frankie Crocker was important yeah. recording too. And then later on, when they started incorporating rap with Mr. Magic and the Rap Attack in New York, was really the epicenter yeah. of what was going on in the urban music during that time period. And I want to briefly talk about track really quick. What was your specialty event in track? Oh, I was, my specialty was 100 and 200. I, I ran the quarter mile every now and then. I, I was a, a, a 45, eight quarter miler, you know, out of the box, but I loved the 200. I set a record for 16 year old, uh, a 20.8 in the 200. And I ran a nine 300. And at that time it was basically, you know, it was a, a yards. So a lot of those records are still, standing because right after I, you know, finished competing, everything went to meters. So a lot of the records are just still there. Mm -hmm. Now, what event were you going to participate in in the 84 Olympics out in LA? The 200 and 100. Mm -hmm. I, was, I, was, I was ready for that one. Now, was it well, bittersweet I, for you once you saw the 84 Olympics and knowing, you know, after the accident, like, man, that could have been me on the podium. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was a, it was a hard pill to swallow, but you know, I just felt that you know, there, there were there were other plans for me. So I I just went alone and I jumped right into music. Okay, and I, that I, I, Yeah, it, it, that's what the thing was for me. I actually flew to LA with um I only had a one-way ticket. And I flew out there to, I was going to get a deal at Capitol. I, went, I was going to Capitol and I was going to get a deal. I didn't know where I was going to sleep. I, my, 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 my plan was, you know, if push came to shove, I'll just sleep in the airport and figure out how to get into the city later. You know, but I, I fortunately, I met someone on the, on the plane and, you know, we talked the whole flight and she basically said I could crash at her place. Until I, I, you know, got things together. So that that was good. Right now, when you went to Capitol, was it where you had a demo already in hand, or kind of like how it was in the New Edition story, where you walk into the office, start singing your heart out, or you just cut your teeth with session work, then that got noticed, and then you got to deal with Capitol. Yeah, I definitely had, you know, I had material already that I had cut demos that I had cut that I had been sending them. And, you know, I didn't get any real response. So I said, well, okay, let me fly out there and check it out. 
and I actually didn't get the deal out there. I basically, you know, lived out there for almost uh, six months. And once I got back home is when I got the call, you know, to come in in, in New York. And that's where I got the deal. I was with um, Melba, Melba Moore. I did a session with her. And um, they, they liked what I was doing with her. And that's when I got with Hush Productions and then Capital came in right after that. Right. So your work as a session singer, you did session work with uh, Evelyn Champagne King, George Benson, James Ingram, now Melba Moore. What's the difference when you're going in as a session singer as opposed to when you're cutting the record on you and knowing not to step on the lead artist's toes because you're there to compliment and not outshine them on their record? Yeah, it's basically, you know, you, I, I always pride myself on knowing my notes and knowing how to hit harmonies and how to support a lead vocal. You know, a lot of artists, you know, don't really know what that's about. You, you'll find some artists, they're great background singers, but then they'll do the leads and it just, it's not working. You know, I, I, I always had a sense of, you know, where vocals needed to be. I, I write my own vocals. And, and when I used to do sessions, you know, I think that was one of the reasons why I was hired a lot is because I would go in and actually design the vocals for them. And then once I started putting those things in place, the lead singer knew right where to fall in. Mm -hmm. So now when you did session work, were you an independent hire or were you part of a union and were getting union scale? No, I was independent. And, and I basically, my, I, I called my own price after a while because I became in demand. I started, you know, and talking to the, um, the receptionists and, and I bring them flowers and I'd say, hey, you know, if anybody's in the studio and they need something, give me a call. And that's how it started happening. And once I did the session with Kashif, because he, I ran into him one day, this is right after he got out of BT Express. And uh, I knew of him, but never met him. And I met him at this event and we was just kind of doing harmonies in the hallways, a couple of guys just singing. And she came over and he says, hey, you know, I, I, I like your voice. You know, he says, um, I'm, I'm doing something with Melba. Why don't you come down to the studio and, uh, you know, let's and do some backgrounds for me. I said, cool. And I think that was professionally, that was where it, it really started to happen for me. Because once I started doing Melba and then Kashif started doing George Benson, Kenny G, all that stuff for that. And did you run into any future stars that got their start as session singles, such as R.G. Wheeler, now R.G. Wheeler Dowling, uh, Allison Williams? Yes, Audrey, you know, I, I met Audrey along the way on that. Allison, Allison Williams, we basically started out together on that session, the Melbourne Moore session. And, um, you know, I, I started writing for people. And then I wrote uh, Mind Up Tonight for Melbourne Moore. And I also wrote a, a duet called All of All of You for, for Melba. And then I started, you know, Melba did a, a, a song, When You Love Me Like This, and I was featured on that. And that was with, um, uh, what was the artist, he, the, the producer's name, Keith Diamond. Keith Diamond, he, uh, he did that song and, I, and they actually, I was coming off a tour and they actually got me at the airport and said that they wanted me to do a session. And I was exhausted. I was actually trying to run from them to go to sleep somewhere. And they took me to the session. And that, that's how I got on uh, When You Love Me Like This. All right. Now, you got your deal with Capital after writing Melba's Big Hit and touring with her. You get your deal. You go into the studio to make your debut album, Let Me Be Yours, in 83. Was it where Capital was very hands-off with you on the project because you're self-contained? Or were they trying to spoon-feed suggestions of who you should have write for you and produce? Oh, no. I um, basically had, you know, all the powers of, of doing the, um, the albums myself. Uh, I had what... Back in those days, they used to call, um, it was like a, um, it was almost a, a record deal, but it was more of a, a production situation. And um, so that means I, they gave me a budget and I had to pay people 
and I had to actually um, come up with my own material. They trusted me with it, but I wasn't directly signed to Capitol yet. It was it was almost a kind of deal like, you know, I think I can deal, you know, I used to, I used to call it. And that's when I, I brought in Paul Lawrence Jones because uh, I introduced to him because he was with a company that uh, that Kashif was with at the time called Mighty M Production. And Mighty M was a production company that would, you know, you could give them your songs and they would get them placed and get a percentage for it. So I met Paul Lawrence there. And then he, I brought him over to do my album. And that's where I met, uh, I actually, um, Timmy Allen, I, he used to be with the group Change. And I saw him walking down the street one day. And this is like, you know, maybe um, about six months before I actually got my deal. And I, I, I just always dug the way he played. And I, and I was following him pretty much. I was like stalking him almost. And I, I met him in the store and, and he says, oh, you're the kid. I said, yeah, I said, I really like the way you play. I said, when I get my deal, I want you to play on my record. And he said, yeah, yeah, you know, Timmy had this way about him. Like, yeah, yeah, okay. And uh, six months later, got the deal. I told Paul Lawrence, said, I said, you know Timmy Allen? He said, yeah. I said, well, I want to play on the album. Can you get in touch with him? And he did. And Timmy showed up at the studio. And when I walked in, I said, hey, Timmy, I said, you remember me? I was the guy that, he says, yeah, you're that kid that um, I ran into on you know, 48th Street. You know, I said, yeah. And that's why I met Timmy, Timmy Allen. And he's a great bass player. Mm. Now, by this point, was Hush Productions already formed or in its early stages? Because I believe Bo Higgins had Hush Management and then that later transformed, morphed into Hush Productions. Is that correct? Or correct me if I'm wrong. Well, yeah, basically it was, it was Charles Huggins who, who, you know, Melba's husband, Charles, was the one who was basically the, the, the spearhead to Hush Productions. And when they started bringing in other artists, that's when they turned it into like a Hush Productions. But Hush wasn't, they weren't my, um, my management. They were basically my advisors. That's, that's how my deal was basically set up. Okay. Now you're a good girl. How did that come about? Because this is right around the time where this would be considered the boogie era of music <laughs> on the urban side, which was post disco and this was pre New Jack Swing. So it was kind of in that weird middle where you still kind of had that disco feel, but incorporating a little bit more sense in the technology of the day. So how did that come about for you, that song? That song basically was um, Paul and I was, was sitting around and it was, you know, Prince and Rick James, they were all about, you know, the nasty girls and, you know, and, and super freak and all that kind of stuff. And we was like, oh, we should do something like, you know, representing the ones that, are, that want to be good girls. You know, there are a lot of good girls out there. And then that's when Paul started, you know, putting it all together and, it was history from then. That was the first single. It was it was pretty amazing to hear that come across the radio. Right. Now, when going to that session, did you guys use four track, eight track? What were some of the equipment that you all used? Did y'all use a Sinclair, of a Yamaha DX7, Moog synthesizer? What were some of the equipment that you guys were using to make those early? Yeah, we were using Lend drums. We were using OB8s at that time. And um, it, we recorded uh, in a 24 track studio it was a like an analog board and basically when we were doing our mixes everybody had hands on the board to move it around because you you know that's what it was back in those days I mean to do a a, a vocal session the way that I would lay my vocals we would actually have a, a, a two inch machine go into the multi-track and had to actually count in and fly the vocals in it would be an all session you know, just to do background vocals. So it, it, it was, you know, not like today. It takes you like about five minutes to throw in background vocals. Right, because you really had to be on point during the days of analog because studio time was not treat cheap and it was going to go live exactly. to tape. So you really had to be on your A game. Exactly. You know, so it was, it was fun. We, we recorded at this studio, uh, Celestial Sounds. 
And that's where most of the big records came out of from Hush, was from that small studio. Oh, wow, man, I didn't know that. So the album comes out, it's a success. Now, I have to notice that you're probably a big Temptations fan because on that album, you covered Just My Imagination. And then on the sophomore yeah. album, All of You in 84, you covered My Girl. So can you talk about right. how big of an influence the Temptations and that whole Motown sound was on you as an artist? Oh, that was, I, I loved the Temptations. I, I, I thought it was really great that they had different voices in everybody, I mean, Eddie Kendrick's voice was was so different from David Ruffin's voice, and how that blend would happen. I was always attracted to vocalists that could blend. You know, I I just that's just one of the things that excite me about you know doing music myself. I just love the way things can blend together, and the Motown sound was 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 pretty amazing. I mean, the, the textures they would be doing and 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 how they would, you know, spread work their songs. It was just it was just really amazing. So I always said I'm going to do a classic song, you know, on each of my albums when I when I put music out because I just think it's it's just giving respect to you know the artists that got to where you are today that paved the way for you. Right. And did any of the surviving members of the Temptations get a chance to hear your renditions of those records when yes. they were released? And what were their thoughts? And yes, reactions? actually, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie Kendricks. I was doing the, uh, doing the Eddie Murphy tour and I heard Eddie Kendricks was in town. He was doing a club. And as soon as I finished my set on the tour, on the Eddie Murphy uh, tour, I, I went over to see Eddie Kendricks. And um, he, he, he saw I was there, he brought me up on the stage to do the way you, the, 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 the things you do, the song, you know, you got mm -hmm. a smile so bright, you know, you could have been changed. He, he brought me on stage and I'm singing the song with him. And I, it was like, it was an out of body experience for me. It was like, I'm here with, you know, Eddie Kendricks, you know, singing a temptation song. It's like, I was feeling like one of the temps. So you know, it was it was it was good time to me. And when I got to the back of the dressing room, he was he was telling me he, and he told me he says, you know, I really love what you're doing, you know, with the with the music. He says you do a great job, and uh, just keep it up. And I, I that was always very special to me. Right, and you also had a chance to work with Lala. Now, was it like? working with her and then you know with her and then Kashif producing and writing for Whitney's debut album which became an across the board smash so what was that like seeing her star rise and then also seeing Kashif star really start to rise from his work with you and Evelyn Champagne King so on and so forth yeah Lala was great to work with I actually um when I was writing the song all of you I I, Lala was the perfect person because she was an excellent keyboard player. I went to her house and we just sat down and she was banging out the keyboard parts. And um, it, it was just, it was great working with her. And I took the song and then, you know, when she heard it in this, once we uh, produced it in the studio and stuff, she was blown away by it. She was great to work with. Cause she, I did a lot of, uh, I did a lot of, cause she's background vocals. And um, and I think that was one of the things that people get, get a little confused with. They say, "Oh, you 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 sound like she," when they're actually hearing my voice. But you know, a lot of people didn't know that I I did a, a, most of his background vocals for him. Right. And, so uh, and, and, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so were you doing backing vocals on Stone Love and uh, Lover Turn Me On? I just got to have you. Yeah, I'm doing that part, you know. Come turn me on. Ooh, never come turn me. I'm, I'm, I was doing that, that whole part when it gets to the end, that love it turn me on part, all that's me. Man, that's that's crazy. And it's crazy to see how that boogie error, that Kashi sound is still being felt to this day. Because when I first heard Treasure by Bruno Mars, I immediately thought, Evelyn Champagne King, I'm in love with Kashi. Right. Immediately. Mm hmm Exactly, exactly, and uh, I also did stuff with uh, Freddie, Freddie Jackson. Freddie, Freddie was on tour with me doing backgrounds for almost a year before he got his deal. 
you know, and, and um, I did um, I did the um, You Are My Lady track with him. You wow. know, so, uh, so yeah, a lot of that's my vocals is that, you know, that everything I need and more, you know, that was wow. all my stuff. Now for some of those songs, like you, like I always felt vocally, you were very similar to Freddie. Now, were there some songs that were cut for Freddie where you were like, man, let me do Rock Me Tonight. Let me do Nice and Slow. Let me do Tasty Love. Or was it kind of like by committee where it's like, no, this is for Freddie. This is for you. Or how did that work? Oh, no. I, I um, When Freddie got his deal, you know, I, 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 <laughs> I, I don't know if he forgot or what, but, you know, I, I actually you know, went with him to Paul's house because, you know, for some reason he he wasn't, you know, particularly ready to work with Paul at that time. And I said, look, Paul is like one of the hottest producers out here. You need to at least go listen to what he what he had. And we went to Paul's house and Paul played. I said, Paul, what are you doing right now? He's like, nothing. I'm like, okay, me and Freddie gonna go to your house and wanna listen to, you know, some of your demo. And we went up there and we listened and Rock Me Tonight came on. And I was like, man, I said, that's really a cool track right there. I said, Freddie, you should do that track. He's like, yeah, I don't know, Luda, I'm not, I'm not really feeling it. I'm like, really, you're not feeling it? I said, are you kidding me? And then I, I think the only reason why he did it was because I said, if you don't do it, I'm going to do it. And he said, well, I'll listen to it. I was like, okay. But uh, that's, how, that's how basically that happened. You lit that fire and that song became a crossover smash for Freddie. And yeah. at that time in the mid eighties for back then they were called black artists. Now we would call them just urban uh, pop radio. Wasn't really friendly unless you had that crossover appeal, like Michael later Prince, Lionel Richie, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So pretty much your important outlets were BT and your regional video music shows along with urban stations and certain locales that were getting pushed. Were you hands-on with Capital? Whereas like, nah, I want to push my records to Detroit. I want to push my records to Texas. I want to go touring mm -hmm. this market, touring that market because I know my base. Yes, I, I wanted to hit all the markets. That, the, the pop thing, they would not let you get close to that pop stuff. We, I, was, I was at a, a radio station and it was an R&B station to my right that I had just visit, visited. And there was, you know, to my, to my left, there was a, um, a, a pop station. And I was like, well, let me go in the pop station and just, just introduce myself. I said, they, they may not know my music or anything like that, but I said, why don't we just start creating relationships? Not really knowing, you know, the business and all at that time. I was just saying radio is radio. And I knew where I was hearing my music. And I was like, okay, well, I could probably get another, a broader audience if I went into this pop station and my rep at the time said, I can't let you go in there. He said, if you walk in there, I can get fired. And I never really understood that until, you know, later on in the game when I really started learning what the business was about. Mm, it was kind of like where they wouldn't let you go in through the front door. So you had to go in through the back, AKA the black door. And I knew that there was probably some discrepancies <laughs> as far as budgeting goes between pop department and the urban department where they got more mm -hmm. money to play with for exposure for marketing for press. Whereas yeah, exactly. for the urban department, you had to make do with the scraps. Exactly. And that, that's where it was just, that's what it was about in those days. It was just, it, you know, you just knew, knew what your place needed and you need to just find your audience. You know, right. So that's that's good. Mm -hmm. Now, what was it like going to the studio, making your follow up album and then going on tour with Eddie Murphy? And this is Eddie Murphy at its height, you know, trading places, uh, coming off of mm -hmm. SNL and delirious pre raw. Yeah. And how, you know, you were getting the folks ready to see the hottest comic in the country. And how, yeah. of course, now his jokes wouldn't fly because politically incorrect and not very friendly to the LGBTQ <laughs> community. But what was exactly. that like, you going on tour with him? And was it where, okay, I got to know how to keep the audience engaged, but not too down to where when they see Eddie, it's going to be a big pop? Yeah, it was, it was a lot of places we went to because Eddie had an amazing... 
his market was was just amazing, you know. And we were doing places like, you know, our Madison Square Garden. So it was huge. This was, and this was my first major tour. You know, prior to that, I was basically doing, you know, stuff in the South. And I was touring kind of like on the Chitlin circuit. And um, so when I got the opportunity, Eddie, Eddie asked me to come out on the road with him. That was an amazing opportunity. But a lot of the promoters didn't really know me. And some of them even warned me because, you know, prior to me being on that tour, the bus boys had been on, had launched that tour with Eddie Murphy. And then they left and then they brought in me. And uh, some of the promoters would be like, well, you know, um, you're gonna go to some markets and they may not embrace you there. It was basically, you know, telling me because it, it, was, it was a white audience. He was like, they may not embrace you, you know, but you know, just kind of get, out, get through it, you know? And that just motivated me even more. So when I got into those markets like that, I was slaying those audiences. I mean, they were coming up on the stage with me singing, you know, my girl and good girl. So you know, they didn't even really know my stuff, but they, they were warm and they, they came up and, and we had a great night. And, you know, I, I was always very conscious of, um, where I was with, with Eddie, he was a great guy. He, 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 he would let me do anything I wanted to do. He, he, was, just, he was just really great to me um, about doing stuff. So I never worried about you know, right. getting out of place with him. He was just a fun guy. Mm -hmm. Now, what was your take when you first heard Melissa Morgan? Now, she's one of the rare artists that can cover a Prince record, do no wrong mm -hmm. to it, because the way that Do Me Baby was rearranged with her vocals and the sound yeah. made it different and did the original justice because Prince is not an easy act to cover at all. No, not at all. You're doing Prince music, you better you better come right. You know, and uh, Melissa did that. Melissa is an amazing artist. You know, her, her vocal style is, 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 is impressive. And, you know, she's just a great person. So I, I don't think anybody else could have cut that track the way that Ma Melissa did. She, she's just an amazing artist. Yep, definitely amazing. And the song Fool's Paradise was sampled by yeah. Jay-Z, featuring Mary J. Blige and Ken Not to Hustle, All Freezable Doubt. Now, just thinking mm -hmm. back to the 80s, it was stacked as far as female vocalist goes. You had Melissa, you had Melba, Shirley Murdoch, mm -hmm. Stacey Ladisol, yeah. the late Phyllis Hyman, mm -hmm. Mickey Howard, um, another yeah. underrated, two underrated female singers that I don't think get their due. Uh, Janice McClain, she had that song, Let's Spend the Night While Making Love. And right. this woman is a bad woman I'm about to mention, Angela Wimbush. Oh, yeah, Angela's great. Yeah, she's just a, a great human being. You know, she's, she's an amazing artist. And um, there'll never be another one like her. No, no. And then, like I said, I put you in the most underrated male R&B singers category. Now, for you, was it where you were kind of looking at the charts, kind of saying, okay, Freddie's here, Luther's here, so-and-so is here, and was it friendly mm -hmm. competition to where you're kind of like, I'm, I'm, I'm coming for that number one spot on that R&B chart? <laughs> I never quite looked at it that way. I, I Luther, I, I actually met him once and, you know, he was okay. He wasn't very friendly to me, but we, you know, I, I never look at, at, at artists to compete with them. I just do what I do and, and I'm good with that. You know, I, I just, I, I never feel that I want to be in competition with, with other artists. I just, if, if, if we're on the same stage, you know that I'm going to bring it, but I'm going to do that anyway, whether you're there or not. You know, I, I'm, I'm very competitive when it comes to, you know, sports or it comes to, you know, doing my business or whatever. But music, I just think music is a, it's supposed to be a very fun thing. And I'm just going to bring it regardless of who's around me. I don't care who's on that stage. I'm going to bring what I do you're going to give them all the smoke because now artists will be very sensitive if you outshine them and you're the opening act and they're the headliner. But back then, mm -hmm. if you got smoked 
on your own show before you even come out. That just lets you know mm-hmm. you need to tighten it up in that rehearsal studio. Exactly. But you know, I, I mean, I, I've been through all that. You know, I've been through people pulling the plug out on me while I'm on stage. I had to actually, I just kept singing. I did it acapella. So it's like, I just, I just do me, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. You were mentioning promoters earlier. I'm curious if you had ever had a run-in with Mr. Al Heyman. <laughs> Budweiser <laughs> Superfest? Yeah. Yeah, I, I did have a little thing with, with, with Mr. Heyman. Um, I was on a show with um, the Whispers and the Blue Notes, and I was, op- I was opening the show. And I hadn't really gotten, you know, you know, my other half of the monies and, you know, and in my agreement, I'm supposed to, you know, be paid in full. And um, they were holding up the door. He actually wasn't even there. I think it was his brother that was, you know, uh, handling the show that night. But he put me on the phone with, with Mr. Heyman and he's like, you know, Lilo, what, what are you doing? I'm like, hey, I'm not doing anything. I'm ready to go. It's like, I just, I haven't been paid yet. And uh, he, he actually, uh, got his brother to go to the, the box office and he gave me my money and I and I, and I show and the wizard was like yo you know what happened you know why are you um you know holding things up so I'm, I'm not holding up I said but I, I didn't get the get my my money yet so it's like they were like oh yeah 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 that that happens to us you know it's like oh okay I <laughs> I didn't know it was going down like that but you know I'm from Brooklyn yeah, yeah. Make sure the money's in hand or else you'll be dangling off the balcony like Flash in the five heartbeats. Let me up! Let me up! You don't from want that to happen. Hours are from nine to five. Uh-huh. Right. And they'll say, forget your office hours. I want to talk to you now. But it is always important to know the business because it's a business yeah. first and what you love to exactly. do second. And with you being self-contained, you learned early on the art of 100% publishing. Don't sell it. Mm-hmm. Don't sell it. Don't sell it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know, and, and you, you, you just have to know all these things, but you don't know coming into the business. And it's something you really can't explain. It's, it, this is the kind of business that, you know, you just have to go through things to, to get it. You, know, yeah. it you, you can't explain this stuff. Yeah, you have to get got a couple of times because like mm-hmm. I mentioned, New edition, how you know they had the dollar eighty seven cent contract, but look at their legacy mm-hmm. now with all six of them, the solo careers, the yeah. group career, and still standing. But like you said, you got to take your lumps and learn, yep. and then exactly. build off that. So segueing, exactly, yeah, segueing into nineteen eighty seven, your Lilo album. What was the process going into that album, and then making cuts such as "Sexy Girl," and my favorite ballad, "I Want to Make Love." all night long because I know that was a quiet storm staple. Mm-hmm. Definitely. It was it was it was directed straight at the quiet storm. And that was a a, a, a very interesting time for me because I had already left Hush. I left Hush Productions right after the All of You album. So I the the Lilo album was I just thought I needed to make a statement. You know it was just one of those I was I was in that head head frame at that time, and I I just wanted to 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 just blow people's socks off with with, with music, and that album was what was going to do it for me. You know, I was on my own, and I was dealing directly with Capital at this point. They were they wanted to sign me directly to Capital, and I just needed to that album to 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 be great. Right, and that, and- that's what I was. Right, and that it was because it was a top ten smash. I'm in love, sexy girl. Yeah. Want to make love, you know, b- sexy girl. I'm in love were big club jams back in '87 because you could just probably mm-hmm. see that activator miss from the club four when you have your bottles and James or your Coke 45 by the table and trying to get that young lady to say it works every time. And '87, <laughs> when I think about it. It was a transition year for R&B when your album came yeah. out. Because mm-hmm. R&B started at that point to become a little bit more aggressive, more youthful. Yeah. And I say full force kind of laid the groundwork with that first with their own mm-hmm. production, their stuff, Lisa, Lisa, UTFO. 
But yeah. then once Key mm-hmm. Sweat's Make It Last Forever album came out and what Teddy Riley and him was doing, yeah, Teddy. R&B started to become more youthful. So what was it like for you seeing that transition from R&B becoming smooth, mellow, adult, aspirational to where mm-hmm. it's pretty much an offshoot of hip hop, which still wasn't being played on radio like right. that at the time. It only be played at night or doing mix shows and young producers like Teddy Riley, Kyle West, I'll Be Sure, we mentioned Full Force, Marley Marl, mm-hmm. all of them said, we're going to take hip hop and we're going to inject it with R&B and give R&B right. a total revamp. Yeah, that was, a, that was a, a really interesting time. And actually, Teddy Riley was in the same building as Hush. He had a management company and they were in the same building. I actually used to do interviews we used to go on interviews together, Teddy and I, you know, they were like, they were actually, um, they, they were like kids and they were called, um, they were called, I think, Men at Work or something oh, like. you're kids, talking about kids at, work. kids at Work, the group that Timmy Gatlin and Teddy was in before they later went on right. to form Guy. Exactly. So I met him way back then, you know, and, and we just used to kind of talk in the car and, you know, do the interviews and. He's like a like a like a, a kid, but always a very nice kid. And um, so when that music started coming in, I said, "Whoa, that's that's Teddy!" And they was like, "Yeah, that's Teddy Riley." I was I was very happy for him. You know, I at that point, I started, you know, um, wandering overseas. I didn't know that even my music was playing over there, but I knew that if things were was a little shaky here and I just wanted to explore something different. So I, I took my band overseas. I had this, um, this club called the, the, no, it was actually like a, a theater that was called the Hammersmith Odeon. And I, was, I got them to actually book me one night there. And I was rehearsing my band like crazy because I didn't even know if the music had been over there or anything. I didn't, I didn't know where the music was, but I was going there to do this show. And I got there and I was rehearsing my band up until the doors opened because I mean, that's just how nervous I was. I didn't know if anybody would even show up. And we did the show and we, we stayed there. We did, they booked another four nights for me to be there. And they said, at that point, I could have actually did Wimbledon once. And I didn't, I, Wembley once. And I didn't even, um, I didn't even know that the music was there. And then come to find out that Sexy Girl was number two on their chart. The uh, Capital Capital Radio is over there and Sexy Girl was number two. But Mm -hmm. it was mainly, I think the people got to know my music because of the pirate station. At that time, they used to have those pirate stations and I didn't even know what that was about. But the pirate stations is what actually, you know, got me known over there. Yeah, because over in the UK, BBC and Capital, they were pretty much the equivalent to Top 40 over here. And you mentioned Pirate yeah. Radio, like Kiss, and we could go down the list. They were pretty yeah. much the only outlets for Black urban youth in the UK to hear urban exactly. music. And it was also where they got to hear first 52nd Street, Loose Ends, Soul to Soul, yeah. Five Star, before exactly. they made their break over here in America. Absolutely. And Sade so as well. I, I, yeah, Sade, exactly. Yeah, so it, that I was, I was shocked. I didn't know anything about it when I got there. Right, and it seemed like the UK always had a reverence and respect for Black artists, Black music. Yeah. We go down the list of all of the acts from the UK who were heavily influenced by music over mm-hmm. here. Now, when you went over, did you ever do uh, Top of the Pops? I was supposed to do Top of the Pops. Let me tell you what happened. I was supposed to do Top of the Pops with Sexy Girl. Um, we, you needed a video to go to Top of the Pops. So they flew me back home. I, I got up that next day, we shot a video and I had the video in my hand and I flew back to London. I sat in the airport all day because most of the, all the people at Capitol Records had went on vacation or something. It was like, it's, it's like when they, all of the, they go on vacation at one time over there. 
So I'm sitting in the airport with my tape and I actually, I missed doing Top of the Pops because of that. Oh man. And, and you know, Oh man, and here's a little top of the pop fun fact for you. Some of you guys may not know this, but the video for Saturday Love by Alexander O'Neill and Sherelle, that was straight from their performance on Top of the Pops. And the connection really? with Jam and Lewis, um, they just announced today as of the recording of this interview that they will be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year. So oh, wow, we want to say congratulations to Jam and Lewis. So for yeah. you, what was it like seeing their evolution from being in the time? to world-renowned songwriters, producers, work with everybody from Janet Jackson, New Edition, the list goes on and on. So what's your thoughts on the impact of Jam and Lewis to the music industry? Oh, I, I think they're, they're an amazing contribution to the, the music industry. I, I, I always wanted to do some work with them. I actually met, you know, uh, Jimmy Jam, you know, at an event and I, 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 I told him, I said, you know, I always enjoyed the way you guys produce. And, and I, there was at one point, I spoke to Clarence Avon and, um, you know, he was, uh, he told me that, you know, they were pretty booked up at the time, but if I would call him, you know, in six months, he would see if, you know, we could, we could hook up and work together. I always thought that would be pretty cool, but I had started getting into other things and it just never happened. But um, yeah, the, those guys are, are amazing writers and producers. Right, and you mentioned Clarence Avant, the Black Godfather, founder of Success Records yeah. and Taboo yeah. from my neck of the woods, North Carolina. He's from Climax, yeah. North Carolina, okay. which is outside of Greensboro and legendary figure in the music industry. But I really think Absolutely. the production songwriting team, I think would have been perfect for you if you would have had the opportunity to work with them. I don't know if you thought about it or whatever. LA and baby things. No, I never, not really. I, because I, I felt that, you know, a lot of their stuff was like Paul Lawrence, you know, Paul Lawrence, I, I think, you know, they sort of adopted a lot of the Paul Lawrence Kashif techniques. You know, I, I felt that Jimmy Jam and them would have been a better connection with me because they, they seem to write what the artist is about. You know, I think they feel their artists differently where, you know, I, I just dug their producing and writing a lot, a lot better. Yeah, because Jam and Lewis, they take the custom suit approach where they're going to sit mm -hmm. down with you, get your profile, yeah. what's your likes, exactly. what's your dislikes, and really build it from scratch and cater it towards exactly. you. Exactly. And that's the and I think that's that's what suits me because I can just come from you know so many different places and and I that's the way I was when I was working with Paul. We would just sit and just talk about things and then it, things would just start to happen. And, 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 and I feel that Jimmy Jam and them work that way as well. Right. And what was it like for you going out to L.A. doing Soul Train? And did you have any interactions pre-show, post-show with Don Cornelius and also the late uh, Dick Griffey of Solar, which that whole sound doesn't get enough mention, Solar, and then, of course, yeah. Leon Silvers. Oh, Le Leon was ridiculous. Oh, I'm, he, He's a phenomenal bass player. I mean, and, and songwriter and guitar player. I mean, but I uh, never met uh, Dick Griffey, but Don Cornelius, yeah, when I first did Soul Train, you know, I, I, I was a little nervous to meet Don Cornelius because I'd never done television. That was the first time I did, you know, television like that. And um, he, he called me in the back and I'm like, well, why, why does he want to talk to me? And they said, well, he does that with new artists. You know, he, he just wants to get a feel and, you know, talk. So I went in the back and he was actually shaving, getting ready for the show and had a towel on his neck. And then he just started asking me a bunch. I didn't realize he was so tall. He, he was really tall. And I remember just kind of looking up like, whoa, you know, I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't get that he's that tall on television. But when I saw him, that was the first thing that came to my mind. But he started asking me different questions and I started getting relaxed with it. And we, you know, we was kicking it a bit and he was asking me, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you this, you know, think about what you might wanna say and stuff like that. And, you know, give me a little advice about the business. And we got out on, this, on the stage and it started happening and he didn't ask me anything he asked me in the room. 
he he I had all new questions. So I had to like figure it out and I was a little, a little nervous about it. And he asked me about hip hop was coming out at that time where people were doing the break dancing and all that kind of stuff. And I was familiar with it, but you know, I I hadn't really had an opinion about it yet. And he asked me, Well, what did you think about it? I said, Well, I think it's a it's another form of art, you know, and it's 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 how the the, the young people today are expressing themselves. And, you know, so I, I always thought that that was an interesting question. It kind of put me on the spot with it, but it, was, it, it all came out pretty good. Right, and you answered my next question because it was interesting at that time where you had some people who were on the fence about rap because they saw disco, saw it as noise, and you got others yeah. that saying, this is just like rock. It's a youthful mm -hmm. expression made by the youth, yep. for the youth. It's not for us to understand, but like we were mentioning earlier, Teddy Riley, Full Force, mm -hmm. Marley Marl, all those young producers, they made you accept hip hop by sneaking it in the R&B and it gave kids yeah. at the time to say, hey, I got something to call my own, whereas I don't want to exactly. listen to Shy Lights and Blue Magic. I can be just exactly. as cool and hard listening to Guy, Levert, New Edition, mm -hmm. Truth. Yeah, and, 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 and I was... You know, I was in tune with that. I was the only R&B artist that we had this club here that was straight up rap. I mean, where you had, you know, uh, uh, Starsky, Lovebug, and you know, I've be, I've got really good friends with him, the DJ, and um, uh, Run DMC used to hang out there, and their brother uh, used to hang out there, and I was the only R&B artist that would go up to that club. It was in the Bronx, and I actually performed there. And a lot of the rappers started to get into my music, you know, and it, I just thought it was a whole other thing, you know, that, that this is how they're expressing themselves. So I wanted to be a part of understanding what that was all about. So I, I got into, you know, the different rap music and, 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 and how they were projecting and, and producing their music. You, know, you have to stay ahead of this stuff. Right, and I think that was the tough part for seasoned artists once New Jack Swing came into play where mm -hmm. you tried to force yourself to infuse hip-hop sound and mm -hmm. R&B while others just naturally flowed in the pocket with it and it was very authentic. Yeah, yeah, and but, but, but that's the whole thing about, I, I think that's where a lot of my you know, being a creative artist, you know, being able to draw and sculpture and paint, you know, I was very interesting, interested in how to, to incorporate those things into what I'm doing. And I think that was why I, I managed to kind of stay around as long as I did, because I'm still like that. I mean, I, I, I listen to, I like that, that rapper, The Baby. I like that song Levitating when he was how he did this thing on that. And even I can't rap, but um I can I can certainly understand how to in, in incorporate that kind of stuff into my music. Right. And then um I want to get your take on we mentioned earlier how black radio was vital for the success of black artists, but also BET, because right. BET launched in 80 it was based out of dc yeah. video soul yeah. was pretty much the lifeline oh. for urban artists if you weren't getting the pop exposure and getting on mtv or your top 40 radio so what was it like for you sitting down with donnie simpson doing video soul and then also did you have any interactions with mr walt baby love from the countdown no didn't 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 have anything to do with him but donnie simpson definitely I would, you know, go into Washington and just hang out with Donnie. You know, we would just kind of, you know, chop it up. And when I did the show, it was um, just in a small room at that time. And I always dug going out there and, and you know, doing his show. That be, you know, that was just a, a great experience for me. And we also, we had a show here. Um, it was a um, video music box. Uncle Ralph. And, Oh yeah, and Ralph, and he was very instrumental in you know to helping me to to get my music across. And you know the, he was one of the the first people I, that played. You know um, he he 
got the, the um, promo to play Want to Make Love, and then they, they asked him to pull it back because Capital was going through something where uh, Europe wanted a downtown, but uh, they wanted Want to Make Love to be the single here in the States. And he, he played it anyway. He actually showed me a letter saying, that, see, this, they're asking me not to play this song. He says, but I love the song, so I'm going to play it. And right. that's the same kind of thing that happened with my song, Holding On. You know, Barry Mayo actually came up to Hush and said, yo, this is a, this is a smash record right here. Why aren't you guys, you know, making it a single and pushing it? And, you know, because they wanted something else, you know, those records didn't get the opportunity to, to shine the way they should have. Right. And this was back when radio DJs had the power to really break records where your record could be yeah. blowing in this region, then other regions yeah. would catch on and it became a smash. Now you mentioned video music box of Uncle Ralph. I was curious, did yeah. your material also get any airplay on New York hot tracks with Carlos de Jesus, formerly oh, on yes. Disco I 92 just, KTU? Yeah. yeah, hot tracks was great. Yeah, we did a lot of stuff with, with, uh, with hot tracks. And uh, they, they used to come to the, have these uh, parties at this club, uh, Leviticus. And Carlos de Jesus was there, and yeah, I used to always be down there. Between that club and I don't know if you uh, was up here enough to remember the club, the Red Parrot. The Red Parrot was like, you know, that was the spot for anybody that was doing R and B. Everybody came through that club. Right, and, and those the, were they, those were great days. Yeah, the club scene in New York was nuts. This was after yeah. Studio Fifty Four. You mentioned Red Parrot. You also had. The Grill, Roxy, Payday, mm -hmm. which was straight hip hop, later the yeah. Tunnel in the 90s, Latin Quarters, yeah. Disco yeah. Fever. And exactly. explain that Bit club me. scene Bit. and what was that like with all these different musical genres all meshing at the same time with everything going on uptown and downtown? Because I believe CBGBs was still up and going at that point as well. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it was, it was, it was great. Bitly's was still going on. It, it, that's all you would do on the weekends. You would just go to each of these clubs and you know you would you would do uh, shows there. You would just show up there. People people knew that you were going to be there. They'd come and they'd follow you over to the next place. It was just it was just amazing time. You know, I I, I so miss you know the club scene. You know that like that. We don't we don't have that club scene anymore here. No, nope. I, I miss it a lot. Yeah, and I definitely miss the music that Hush and that period pre-New Jet Swing because I appreciate it more so now that I'm in my mid to late 30s where it's very smooth, very easy. You want to get with your lady, have a nice beverage, exactly. do some pillow talk and just really enjoy <laughs> yourself. And it was all about exactly. the art of the imagination. Whereas now you pretty much know what they're talking about within the first five seconds. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But that's what that's the way I came up on music. I mean, we came up, you know, in the basement parties with the red light. And, you know, when you hear the Delphonics and La 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 means I love you. And, you know, you hear all those like songs and you ready to slow dance with this girl that you've been checking out all night. You know, I was in I was in the basement with the red light. It took me all night to, to dance with this girl. I was scared out of my mind. But, you know, those were good times. Right. You know, a lot of people don't understand those music. That music was teaching you, you know, what you needed to know for life, you know, and and that's what I got from a lot of the music from the Sam Cooks and you know a, a lot of those other artists. They, they were they were teaching you about life stuff that you know was happening and that you didn't have any clue of at that time in your life. But as you ran into those moments, you know, I found love on a two way street. It's like what you know. It's like you, you, you could identify at this point. So you, you weren't caught totally off guard. Right. And can you give me either your most underrated male or female R&B singer or band that you felt should have had more success, but for reasons or another, just didn't crack it? Yeah, I, I, I think the, the group Sky, I think they could have been a lot bigger. They were, they were really good band out of Brooklyn. And uh, they got that, that, that one hit and that really started taking up, but then it didn't, you know, it didn't really work a lot for them. I, I, I thought that they were really a good band. 
to to that didn't really get their their total shot. Yeah, call me, and then later on, there were one of the acts that transitioned well when New Jack was coming in with Start of a Romance, Real Love, mm-hmm. and it was very authentic. But I felt the one band that should have had more success, they had the backing of Q because they were signed to Quest Records. Dream Boy, are you familiar with them? Uh-uh. Yeah, they were out of uh, Oak Park, Michigan, not too far from Flint. They were signed to Quest Records. They had cuts mm-hmm. such as um, I Want to Know Your Name, Friends to the End. Mm-hmm. And they were a good group, but I think their, their problem was, I think what ended up happening was Ready for the World came out, and Ready for the yeah. World had the co-sign of Electrifying Mojo out in Detroit on right. WJLB. And he was a big deal and just really didn't have that push. But I felt they should have been bigger. And another mm-hmm. underrated female singer that I feel don't get her due, Regina Bell. And also oh, yeah. her, her brother, Bernard Bell. If you look at all the Teddy mm-hmm. Riley's cuts, his name is along exactly. there with him. And can you just talk mm-hmm. about his influence in his work, and then also Regina Bell and how she could just sing circles. Oh yeah, Regina, she had great pipes. She was introduced by the Manhattans. You know, they basically brought her into the music situation. And uh, I thought, you know, she was gonna you know, truly blow up after all the, uh, the Disney stuff with people. And that was great, the stuff that her and people were doing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I met her brother, uh, and we were going to do some things together, but we never, you know, got the chance to to work together. But um, yeah, he was a good guy. I, I met him at a, at a show I went to. I think it was a Regina Bell show. And um, he was a good guy. I, I, I wanted to work with him, but never got the chance. to. Right. And then I felt two more male R&B singers that's underrated. Big Bub formerly of today, underrated, because I tell mm-hmm. people Big Bub is just like a more hip-hop adopted version of Luther, vocally, and then another yeah. underrated male R&B singer, the late Robert Brookins. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, this, it, 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 this business is a hard business, and, and unless you, you, you understand what it's about, you can get lost in it, you know, and it, and a lot of people don't understand that it's it's the when you're with a major company. I mean, when that machinery is turned on, you can't miss. You know, it, everybody knows who you are. But when that's not there anymore, and you're still out there doing what you're doing, a lot of people don't know because you know the machinery isn't there. So they think you went away, but you actually didn't go away. You just you know you don't you don't have that that backing behind you that you know, that level of backing behind you anymore. It's all about that machine and, it, and yeah. all about that push. Absolutely. You know, even Prince even talked about that. I mean, it, when he when he left his record company, you know, Prince was starting to die out. You know, Michael Jackson, it, it happens. You know, and, that, and that's, that's what it's about. Right. It kind of feels like wrestling where the booker and everybody backstage wants to write the script of who they want to put over and have wear the belt and they say hey you were on top for this amount of time we want you to drop the belt so that this hot new artist can come in and there's like a lot of pitting one against each other and like you said unless you have somebody in your ear steering you right telling you the real instead of just the fluff then you can get Mm -hmm. lost in the sauce absolutely and you know you you may get paid to take the dive you know, but that's how they'll end it with you, you know, just so someone else can, you know, step on your shoulders. Right. So, and you know, that's the name of the game. Yeah, right. And were you at Capitol when Tracy Spencer signed? Mm-mm. No. Okay, yeah, because I know she was signed to Capitol, so I, w- I was just curious in regards to that. So let's talk about your new single that will be dropping at the end of this month. Tell us about it and... Anything else you got going on? I believe you are a fabulous painter as well, correct? Yeah, I did. I got it. It's on my um my website. It has a lot of my artwork on there. You can check out if you go into the um the gallery, the art gallery on my website. But yeah, I'm I'm dropping a new single. It's um June. I think it's June 10th, and it's called um Truth Be Told, and it's basically about you know. Everything that you do in your life is, is all about you. 
And I, I have this saying that you can't blame anybody for your life. You know, it, you just have to look at yourself and say, I have met the enemy and it is me. And you have to work it out it, because nobody's going to give you anything. You have to make it happen for yourself. And that's basically what the song is saying. It's, it's, it's all about you and dealing with it. All right. And so, you know, I, that's what that's about. And I have a, the, the, the CD Slow Jams that's out. That's a lot of my uh, classic uh, slow jams that I did off of each album. So it's called Slow Jams. Okay. And where can people get that album and uh, look forward to the new single? When, when would it be available and where will it be available? Slow Jams is out now. The new single will be out June 10th. And they can get it at Spotify. And it's on all of the uh, streaming uh, stuff. So, and, and you can come to my website. It's um, Instagram. And uh, it's called, it's at Lilo Thomas. Okay. Now. And Facebook, Instagram and Facebook. Okay. Now, final question. I'm going to get you out of here on this before we give shout outs and plug social media. What are your thoughts on the evolution of R&B from doo-wop to Motown to disco, soul, boogie, new jack swing? Hip hop soul, neo soul, just R and B in all its different incarnations, and where you see it going. I I think all of that is is coming back around. You know, it's it's music is it's funny that way when when you don't when you think it's 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 not here, it's actually happening somewhere else. And you know, having the opportunity to to travel around the world you'd be surprised how music just cycles the planet. And I think, you know, when you, when you see like Bruno Mars is winning with that, the, the group he has, I mean, all that stuff is basically Delphonics, you know, and um, uh, um, what's the name, the, the Whispers, and uh, um, I just don't want to be lonely. What's the group? Uh, the main um, ingredients. Mm -hmm. All that, all that that they're doing was basically that music. So I, I really think that you know, music just recycles. It comes back around, right? And, and you know, the kids get they, they get older, and like you said before, you you get to that point in your life where you don't want to hear you know a, a lot of you know noise and and words that are put there for shock value. You want something to be. When you're with your lady, you got the little drink on the side, and you just want to cool out and and just have a a, a good evening with you, with your woman. That that's what that music represents, right? And you could just play it all the way through and just Absolutely. think back to the times that you had, or like, man, I remember mm -hmm. taping this song off the radio and requesting it for the love dedication on the Quiet Storm. And like you mentioned, um, Anderson Pac and Bruno Mars with Silk Sonic. And that whole album yeah. was a tribute to 70s Soul. And then they just recently covered Love Train by Confunction. And that whole right. style and sound is getting introduced to a whole new audience. Absolutely. And even you see these commercials, they, they're playing Jackie Wilson. I mean, all this stuff is coming back around because now it's, it's changing again. There's another dynamic going on. These younger kids, they're getting older. They're not into the crazy stuff anymore. They want to relax. They want to get, a, they get their jobs. You know, they got their lady, that, that, that official lady that they're going to be with. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just a different, a different dynamic. And it, it has to, they have to, they gravitate to that music. I mean, we mm -hmm. did it. I did it when I was a kid. You know, I was I was starting to listen to stuff that my mom was listening to. And I was like, you know, I didn't get it. But as I got older, I started getting into women and doing my thing. I got it. I'm like, oh, I, I get this now. Yep. So when you become of age, folks, you'll understand why Lenny Williams was crying on that record and why he watched TV until TV <laughs> exactly. went off. You got to go through it in order to understand his yeah, pain you, you have through to. that record. You have to. It's a part of life. You have to go through it. You know, yeah. and, and, and that's what that music is there for. 
Right. And but please don't bring back the horrible haircuts, the Jerry Curl, the Shag, and any of the horrible yeah. hairstyles and fashions of that time period. And, and but, the platform too. <laughs> right, 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 right. Man, I could talk to you for hours, but I know you got people to see things to do. So do you have any shouts you want to give Mr. Thomas before we conclude and also plug your social media? Oh, you know, I just want to I want to thank you for doing what you do. I mean, we need you know, guys like you that, that at the radio stations and, and that's helping, you know, get the music out there and get these interviews on so people can see that, you know, we're still out here doing our thing. And um, if you want to reach me, I'm at um, I'm Instagram, at Lilo Thomas. And, you know, I have a Facebook, at Lilo Thomas, and the website, lilothomas.com. All right. So you can check them out on all those platforms and you catch this interview on audio and video, wherever you stream your podcast mm -hmm. and also on YouTube channel of the same name. So ladies and gentlemen, let's please give a round of applause and a big thank you to Mr. Lilo Thomas for coming on Beyond the Album Cover. Thank you once thank again. You. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Sir. Thank you so much. Yes, sir.